Welcome to this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live for Tuesday, March 25th, 2014. This program is a weekly live recorded broadcast and tweet chat from the organizers of Stanford Medicine X, a conference that explores the intersection of emerging technology and medicine. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of the individual participants and not necessarily those of the Stanford University School of Medicine or the conference organizers. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Alicia Staley, also known as Stales, is the moderator of today's episode and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford Med X. Please note, you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in-studio guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. The topic of today's show is entrepreneurship, innovating in healthcare, human-centered design, and brainstorming challenges. The purpose of this episode is to explore the topic of entrepreneurship and digital health. What are the opportunities for entrepreneurs in digital healthcare? How might we begin to look at how patient-centered design can also serve unmet market needs? How can design thinking lead to new and better innovations in healthcare? What challenges do digital health entrepreneurs encounter that are unique to healthcare? What might entrepreneurs achieve by including patients at the outset of the design process. With us today is a diverse panel of patients, physicians, technologists, and entrepreneurs with insights into health and healthcare. The goal of this program is to hear from them, have them share with us their views on these issues, and of course, to answer your questions out there from our viewing audience on Twitter. Thank you, Larry. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to go st actually straight into our group of panelists. We are lucky today or tonight to have a wonderful group who have a lot of expertise in this really important topic. Some questions that we hope to answer are what is human-centered design, what are some unique problems in uh, healthcare entrepreneurship, and what do you know if you have actually a good idea to tackle? So our first guest is uh, Dr. Jason Wong. He's an internal medicine physician and co-author of The Innovator's Prescription, a book that describes how disruptive innovation will transform healthcare. Dr. Wong is also a co-founder and chief medical officer of Polkadoc, a smartphone app that will deliver high, of highly affordable primary care. Our other guest is Doug Cantor, who's an e-patient. He's a type 1 diabetic designer, photographer, and founder of Databetes. Databetes develops software to help diabetics patient, diabetic patients better manage their condition. Another guest that we have is Dr. Fasayo Oshitelu, who's, a head, who's head of consumer insights at NerdWallet Health. He holds an MD and MBA from Stanford University, where he focuses on health services research, digital and consumer health, and prior to NerdWallet, was an active digital health entrepreneur. Noga Levener is the CEO and founder of Picnic Health, and which is a patient-centered tool for helping chronic disease patients pull their health information out of the medical system so they can better understand and coordinate their care. She previously founded the student loan company, Lumni USA, and has a degree in human biology from Stanford University. And our next other guest, who's been dubbed both a health hooligan and physician artist because of his diverse perspective as a clinician, executive designer, professor, advisor, entrepreneur, speaker, and last but not least, a technology advocate. Dr. Gulati is the chief medical officer and head of product innovation for Physicians Interactive Holding, where he leads a team to ideate, design, build, and, dis and deploy disruptive solutions for a health audience. His expertise is in transforming small and large organizations to meet future healthcare needs. 
And Jenna is the co-founder and CEO of Recovery Record, the leading mobile platform for eating disorder management that is used by over 150,000 people living with eating disorders and 4,000 treating practitioners. Jenna's expertise is in clinical psychology and her passion for patient-centered design was honed in in her recent role as design thinking and entrepreneurship instructor at Stanford University Graduate School of Business. So with that, I'm actually going to start off with Jenna. Um, to you, what does human-centered design mean? Really great question to start the conversation. Um, to me, human-centered design is putting your user firmly in the driving seat of innovation. It's letting them, it's putting aside your preconceptions and letting them lead your most important innovation decisions, from identifying a need to finding product market fit uh, to uh, launching and scaling into a market. And there's a lot of processes um, and, and guidelines around how to do that. And Noga, your your you know in Picnic Health, I think a lot of what you're doing tries to address a lot of these issues. So, what can you add to to Jenna's comment on what is human-centered design? Yeah, I think um, Jenna obviously has tons of expertise and has kind of summed it up really well. The one thing I would add is basically that we make sure that patients are involved in every step of the process, no matter what we're doing. Um, whether it's thinking about our business model or, you know, thinking about what colors we want to use. Uh, we really work with, with patients, with the people that are, you know, the humans at the center of our product um, every step of the way. And, and you talked about patient-centered design. Well, we have Doug, who, who he himself is an e-patient scholar. For you, what does human-centered human design mean? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I've been a type 1 diabetic for 27 years, and I think one of the reasons that I started DataBees was just because I'm frustrated with the current process. Um, there's so much data being generated by a lot of great hardware, but making sense of it and really trying to help people make better decisions throughout the day is really, you know, the goal. I think that it's, it's a, definitely a challenge to be addressed right now. Thank you, Doug. And uh, Fasayo, you work at NerdWallet, which is trying to help people make decisions. In your mind, what do you, what do you interpret human-centered design as being? I'm going to jump to uh, Dr. Wong. Um, I think, Fasai, your, your uh, mic is muted. If you want to give it one more shot, otherwise we'll go to Dr. Wong. Okay. I think, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I think the biggest uh, thing is not reinventing the wheel, really looking at what people are currently doing and just observing. You know, that's the, the biggest first step. Uh, and um, for instance, uh, for us, you know, we try to deliver high quality information online. And so part of it is just understanding online activity as it is and, you know, being humble enough to see and use the tools that are out there already. And so, and, uh, that's, that's pretty much the biggest thing I would, I would like to add uh, to that. Very well. And, no, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and, Jason, uh, you know, you're obviously a practicing physician, but we're inspired enough to, to create your own uh, application, providing better access to care with Polkadoc. How are you sort of using design thinking or design methodologies to enhance the patient experience or even the clinician experience? Well, I think having uh, studied disruptive innovation for a number of years, uh, it was important for us to first realize where patient-centered design was most likely to come from. And uh, what disruptive innovation theory tells us is that rarely are the incumbents going to adapt their market perspective in that, uh, you know, we had hospitals whose main interest in improving uh, their business model was to keep their beds full. For physician practices, it was to improve patient throughput. For insurance companies, it was to improve their medical loss ratio and try to deny claims. And it's fascinating that none of these really benefit patients that much if, and often cause them harm. And so what disruptive innovation theory tells us is that very often, the, uh, you know, the patient-centered uh, innovations are really going to come from outside traditional stakeholders. 
So, um, you know, in, in, in creating my own uh, startup, uh, I purposefully wanted to look for people who, who um, were not inside the industry, who ha had not grown up as physicians, but instead looked at it with a very uh, market-oriented view about building a service really around delighting the patient. It's very uh, powerful insight, and I think it's very humbling at the same time that sometimes we need to have change uh, come from outside. Um, and I think, uh, Dr. Gulati, you, your, your experience as, you know, physician, physician executive, and an entrepreneur, I think, could shed a lot of light. From your perspective, what do you think is a good definition of human-centered design? Well, I, I certainly agree with everything that's been said by the other the other panelists here. And one thing I can I can possibly add to the conversation is I think we oftentimes um, produce technologies or solutions that oftentimes interfere with the way we actually conduct um, our services, whether you be a clinician or the patient in this human centered design approach. And so we really need to think about ways in creating solutions or technologies that are somewhat invisible in the process. So thinking of technology as an enabler to uh, better the services that we provide for patients and oftentimes they become more disruptive in the process than they are helping the situation. So how do we make them invisible in the workflows is, is, is a key challenge that I think we need to address going forward. No, it's, it's very useful. Uh, Dr. Wong, you, you mentioned the competing priorities between all the different stakeholders and sadly the pa patients are almost getting marginalized in this process. How do you see sort of this digital health or what we call M health designed for multiple users to enhance sort of the patient experience, clinician experience, and, and, and try to address all those sensitivities? And if, if you have a good example of that, that would be really useful. Well, I think, I think it's an excellent uh, challenge to whether or not the model can actually work. I think what's fascinating is that um, you, you mentioned competing, competing interests. I actually think that... Uh, most of the dominant uh, incumbents really have aligned interests. They've formed this ecosystem to work with one another, and the patient has, is kind of marginalized, as you said, or has been disenfranchised for, for so long. Trying to create a service in healthcare that appeals to them, um, because it comes from outsiders, um, can be a challenge, but I look at other industry models where you didn't really have to actually convince patients or, or in their case uh, their users to really do uh, anything differently. It was something that they just didn't have access to before. So I'm, I'm thinking of uh, innovations like the automated teller machine at uh, your local bank. Um, you know, banks were very concerned about what this would mean to their business model and in fact consumers leapt at the chance to be able to conduct transactions that banks used to have to pay their tellers to do and yet we're willing to do it for free simply because of the convenience and accessibility to financial transactions that ATMs and later online banking and mobile banking have afforded us. Same thing with booking our own travel, doing our own taxes. You know, I don't think there was ever really a need for a big, big marketing push to convince people to take up uh, these new innovations. I think there was already a receptive market there. They were just looking for choice. And I think when it comes to some of these new uh, M Health innovations, I think uh, we may see the very same dynamic play out. Very useful. Uh, no, Noga, in terms of we're talking about, Jason was talking about patient choice and empowering patients, providing patients access to the information and control the, of their information is probably the epitome of, of uh, patient-centered design. How would, you, how would you add to what Jason just said in terms of what people want and what are you providing for them? Yeah, um, so I'll start with, I'll answer the second question first. Um, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is um, making it really easy for patients to pull their data out of the healthcare system um, and out of different EMR systems and the really innovative element to what we're doing is about where that data comes from. So, you know, in the past, um, if you wanted to get information out of the healthcare system, you had to go and make a deal with Stanford Hospital and make a deal with, you know, UCSF and make a deal with Kaiser in order to, to integrate with them. Um, we're actually going through the new patient portals or my chart uh, accounts, if, if that's more familiar uh, for folks that are coming online and are now mandated uh, through meaningful use. And so, 
I think um, you know what we have essentially what we essentially did was kind of look at the experience that um, you know the, the experience that I had as a patient and the experience that patients had of wanting to see this data, wanting to understand what was going on, and sort of struggling to move information around and recognize that we had to really think outside of the box um, if we wanted to get this data into patients' hands. We realized that you know, the old strategies of trying to work with the industry just weren't going to work. So, um, so I think you know, uh, this, is pro this is another good example, I think, of a case where, um, where you know, the sort of incumbent players have one set of priorities and patients had a different set of priorities. And um, figuring out how to give patients what they want and what they need really meant um, sort of, for, for lack of a better way of describing it, going around um, a lot of the, the industry players that you know, folks have been talking about. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Noga. I, I actually want to take a brief second to acknowledge some people listening um, all over the world, for that matter. We have Meredith Gould, Chris from Dallas, uh, Philip from Vanco Vancouver, um, Courage from British Columbia. So thank you for, for watching MedX Live. Um, before we go to, we're going to have a, take a brief break, but I want to give Jenna an opportunity to add to what was just talked about because I think at the end of the day, what we care about is if the technology is actually going to help improve outcomes. And what you're working on, Jenna, is, is very compelling in ter terms of uh, managing uh, eating disorders. So if you sort of tell... Tell us what about what it is that you're doing, what's unique, and, and how it's been effective at managing uh, these outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to provide a little bit of context, uh, Recovery Record reinvents the therapy homework experience. So for, for many mental health conditions, uh, therapy homework has traditionally been done with pen and paper, and it's the active ingredient of treatment. Um, so we've sort of taken that best practice, which is very familiar to patients and providers, and um, made it much more engaging in a mobile application and boosted compliance through a lot of different positive psychology and behavior change techniques. And in doing so, um, we are boosting outcomes, and we're then sharing that data with the treatment team so that they can make more informed treatment decisions. Um, and we've actually, you know, in, in doing so, um, just looping back to the previous conversation, we've taken a really interesting bottom-up market approach. We've empowered the patient to such an extent that they're referring their clinicians to the technology. So we haven't picked up the phone and called one doctor or nutritionist, nutritionist or psychologist. The patients are doing that for us. Um, so, And this is traditionally a fairly um, old-school industry that's being disrupted by the patients themselves, which is, it really speaks volumes to um, that direct-to-consumer kind of approach. Um, but we have just sort of done some analysis and putting together a research paper at the moment that's showing that the application in and of itself um, is moving a lot of our users from to being symptomatic to being non-symptomatic, which is just so exciting. Um, but. Uh, that's in press, so that's a sneak preview. <laughs> no, well, 100,000 users, it's, it's quite remarkable. We're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we will speak to Dr. Gulati and Dr. Oshitalo to learn about what are the exciting things that they're doing in this space. Let's take a quick break to remind those of you just joining us for this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live that we are here with a panel of patients, providers, technologists, and entrepreneurs discussing the topic entrepreneurship, innovating in healthcare, human-centered design, and brainstorming challenges. This program is made possible by the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Health Research Quality. Time to take a shout out to Twitter. If you are following this conversation online or on Twitter, Alicia Staley, also known as Stales, is moderating the Twitter discussion on the MedEx hashtag. We have with us today a panel of patients, providers, technologists, and entrepreneurs. E-patients and caregivers out there, what questions do you have for our panelists today? Why do you think it is important to involve patients and caregivers in the healthcare innovation process? Healthcare providers, technologists, and research out there, what would you like to see from entrepreneurs to ignite patient-centered innovation in healthcare? 
tweet us your questions or responses, and we'll do our best to have the panel address them this evening during this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live for Tuesday, March 25th, 2014. All right. Thanks again, Larry. Um, so, Dr. Let me see, Dr. Golati, I think you would be a perfect person to answer this question. So we have a question from the public space asking, how do we reconcile the gap between patient-centered design and evidence-based medicine when most of the studies are never designed with a patient in mind? Um, you know, evidence-based medicine, by definition, will probably always trail anecdotal medicine, and it's a real challenge. So from your experience, how, what do you think the best ways to reconcile that gap? Well, I'm at, it's a great question, actually, and, I, and I'm not sure that a lot of folks are actually addressing this, and I think part of it is rooted in the fact that we our medical system is, is deeply seated in, in, a, in a highly regulatory and legal-based system, and so it's defensive medicine that's oftentimes being practiced today. Uh, the challenge is, is that we have a bunch of data sets, we have a bunch of information that are oftentimes conducted in vacuums and not with the appropriate individuals. We have the technologies today, I believe, to be able to capture real-time information, real-time data, and actually study it in, re in real patients in the real world. However, we don't have the processes in place to actually approve it and reimburse physicians for following those types of sort of real-time guidelines. Um, so oftentimes, many of our guidelines tend to be five, ten years old and outdated, when in fact, um, if you sort of crowdsource a lot of the data sets that we had from existing patients, you would certainly see, see different outcomes different, from different trial studies that oftentimes aren't represented in the guidelines. We just don't have a system to, to be able to capture and um, sort of flip that, flip that back out to the physician where it makes uh, legal sense for them to actually abide by any of those sort of uh, you know, modern day solutions that we can, that we can generate. A great question. And Dr. Ashitalu, um, at NerdWallet, you're trying to empower consumers and patients to have better information to make good decisions. What do you think are sort of unique challenges um, with reconciling the evidence-based medicine gap and patient-centered design gap? I think you're, uh, you just need to unmute your mic. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I'm um, really thinking about the patient. Um, uh, our goal is to use publicly available information to help them to make better decisions regarding um, the major financial decisions regarding their health care. Um, so the question was how do we use patient-centered design and how do you reconcile that with evidence-based medicine? Uh, for us, we, are, we think the patients are going to be the drivers that in, in a lot of ways. First, because the cost pressures are actually shifting towards the consumer in a very, very uh, profound way. So, for instance, uh, you're having uh, high deductible health plans uh, on the rise, uh, which, which was not the case before. So, you know, there's an added incentive for consumers, patients, to really take charge of their health care. Be it, in term, be it uh, medication expenses, finding the right physicians or the right uh, hospitals for the procedures. And so we're starting to take our focus. The first step is really um, engaging uh, the patients at this crucial time when health reform, private sector pressures, uh, when people are starting to have more responsibility. And so our, our, our bet is that um, you know, the patient uh, will play a bigger role in this and might actually be a, a central force in actually pushing towards uh, bridging, you know, their concerns with, you know, the, the physician's academic uh, evidence-based medicine concerns as well. So, yeah. Okay. And Doug, I think you're sort of... I would say almost like the gold standard in what would be the best way to, to tackle this problem because, you know, I, I'm very curious to hear what inspired you to pursue your current venture, but I'm sure there was a gap that you've noticed that you felt um, that you wanted to fulfill. So how does Databetes help patients with diabetes live a better quality life? No, absolutely. It's a great question. I, I you know, as a, as a patient for as long as I've, as I've been, 
I know that there's tremendous knowledge in all this data that we're generating, but it's just not being aggregated in one place. Um, building on some of the comments earlier, a lot of the data is locked in different silos. I use three different brands of devices, and they none of their software talks to each other. So I think that getting all the data in one place and then being able to learn from it, and then when things happen in your life that you're repeating things that you've already done before, to take that knowledge and the experience that you've um, already gained and apply it forward. Um, I think that's really a, a, a huge part of why I started Databetes. And it's just trying to bring the same sort of um, design thinking that we're so used to in the consumer web into the medical side. Okay, thank you. We actually have a good question from, looks like from the Hurt Blocker. Um, and her question is, how can, sorry, how can patients who attempt to innovate become entrepreneurs to help their community, but at the same time not be viewed as selling out by other patients? Um, sort of maintaining a level of integrity in that process. Uh, I'll actually open it. Uh, so Doug, what would you recommend? Um, <laughs> well, I think, <clears throat> you know, I think there's a, a lot that needs to be done. There's just so many different problems. Even within, you know, the problem with diabetes care in the U.S. is not one problem. There's multiple different types of patients facing multiple different challenges. Um, I think that keeping the patient in mind and really trying to help them in between their clinic visits I think a lot of what we're trying to do is really trying to um, also connect patients with others who may have insight that they can give their fellow patients. Um, I think all these things, I don't, I think selling out is, is not a huge concern for me. <laughs> Agreed. I think, at least this is my caveat, if someone believes in something strong enough, it's not about selling out as much as pursuing an idea that I think is meaningful. Uh, and I think everyone here uh, is genuine about their efforts, and it's part of their DNA and, and, and integrity. Um, one question I think that is, is really useful, uh, Jenna, you were an instructor at the business school with uh, Startup Garage and, and design thinking. And one of the uh, points that's often, often, often taught is you know, to test early, and learn from mistakes. But in healthcare, you know, one of the risks, we can't really have this rapid prototyping um, and have a lot of mistakes. So there's different types of techniques that you could use, and I'd be curious to learn from you and what you could share on when it's appropriate or inappropriate to adopt that rapid prototyping methodology in the design process. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, Really good question, and actually I think the answer sort of depends on where in the innovation, healthcare innovation spectrum you lie. So for example, for some of the um, uh, devices and, and medical devices and more invasive technologies, um, there are still ways to prototype, absolutely, um, particularly around user experience and, and adoption um, and understanding people's behaviours, but I think it's a lot easier for technologists actually. Um, so. My answer would be early and um, in abundance. Uh, essentially, what you're trying to do at the first stage of what we call ideation, once you've, once you've actually identified a need that you'd like to solve, is generate as many possible solutions that you can think of. Um, and usually the most obvious solutions come to mind very quickly. Um, and so the ideation process is about discarding those obvious solutions um, and building some of the more interesting um, out of the box ideas and uh, there's a whole lot of ways of prototyping like literally getting some cardboard cutouts um, to, to construct a patient experience. Um, I've seen teams you know get get uh, colored markers and, and sort of draw footsteps on, on your hospital floor to direct patients to the right room at the right place because it was so difficult they were getting lost in, in this particular health center um, and the technologist's option is just drawing screenshots on a piece of paper and putting that in front of a patient, giving them the pen and getting them to draw what they'd like to see or, or speak their thoughts out loud um, of what they're thinking, how they're interpreting what you're putting in front of them. And 
you know, it's incredible the assumptions that we make about user experience design and what's relevant to patients before we do that simple exercise. Um, but you do need to put your ego at the door because probably you think you have an awesome idea and you put it in front of a patient and it's going to get bagged or you'll uncover different things that were unexpected. So being prepared to discard ideas early. Um, and all of these are fairly non-invasive and harm-free. I mean, of course, there's the question of how to access those patients in an ethical way. Um, and I, you know, I think that's an interesting question um, and a somewhat difficult one. Um, but patients, you know, generally appreciate being involved in that process um, from the outset. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Joe. Uh, from Twitter, and his question is, what strategies have panelists found to be effective at engaging uh, or activating uh, patients? Uh, Nova, I think your your uh, startup, Picnic Health, and your experience there may shed a lot of light. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we sometimes fight against as entrepreneurs in healthcare is a perception that pay, you know Americans don't care about their health. Um, you know, there's a kind of um, there's a there's an obvious um, issue in healthcare where you know patients themselves aren't in, uh, necessarily in in control and kind of bearing the costs for their own care. Um, so they're not you know they're not sort of considered active participants in their care. Um, and I think you know we have to sometimes fight against those perceptions um, and recognize that if you actually give patients tools to be involved in their care. Um, they are eager to take a more active role. Right now, it's so incredibly difficult to be involved in your care um, when you know it's it's really really a, a challenge, almost like an extra job, just to sort of follow the basics of what's going on. Um, you know what recent test results are, what's been done, and um, how you know kind of pass information back and forth between your doctors. So my my um, experience has been that just get putting the tool in patients' hands. Um, is really responding to a need and a desire that's already out there that you don't you know once you do that you don't have to actually do a lot to kind of convince patients um, that there's a reason to be engaged. Well that's really that's useful and uh, I think Jason with with Polkadoc you know it's obviously a patient is extremely motivated to see a physician um, so uh, I would imagine the best thing that could be done is making it very simple and easy. So how has Polkadoc helped patients get better access or faster access? Well, we like to think that we've uh, both made it highly affordable as well as highly accessible. I think even more so than many of the telehealth companies that are popping up every week or so. Uh, primarily because we've taken the need for a synchronous chat um, uh, out of the equation. Uh, I think as, pleasant, as pleasant as this Google Plus Hangout has been, I would say that for a lot of basic medical care, a uh, face-to-face -face encounter is not necessary. And if we can use software to automate some of these processes, then uh, I think uh, we could really make care that much more scalable. And I think the mistake we're making with a lot of telemedicine is that it's akin to an ATM at a bank, which I mentioned earlier, something that was highly disruptive, and yet we've put a banker inside the ATM machine and we can only conduct transactions if there's a banker behind the machine, uh, you know, punching buttons, making calculations and handing you money. Uh, and yet that's the way we built telemedicine, I think, to date. So um, I think that's the way we've made our service different. And I think um, to, to uh, add on to the previous comments about uh, engaging patients, I think it, it's pretty clear if you just do um, a, a, some research into Google search terms what patients are really interested in. They may not be interested in seeing a doctor whether it's face-to-face -face or using a simple affordable uh, service like Polkadoc even even if it's affordable for something like hypertension, hypercholesterol, anemia. but um, they will search for something like you know birth control which is where we built our first service and if you want birth control from us we are going to need somehow to get your blood pressure. We are going to need to know about your smoking history. And by the way, if you uh, do have high blood pressure and you do have uh, problems with uh, smoking tobacco, we can add those services. Um, but I think the most important thing is to make a service that uh, patients are interested in engaging with uh, and then 
to, to feed them the spinach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Gulati, I, I believe you had something to add to that as well. Yes, uh, you know, one of the, the, the misconceptions that we oftentimes have is that we think that there's going to be this magical technology that all of a sudden is going to be put out into the marketplace and then start engaging patients. Um, I, I personally don't think it's a technology issue. I think if we take the human design approach and uh, approaches to, to creating the technologies that we produce, that's great, but at the end of the day, it's a psychological issue. And so one of the things that we've learned in our process of connecting doctors with patients is it's clearly not a one-size-fits-all approach. So to every individual patient or every consumer, if you're talking about the preventative world, um, there's a different type of solution that's going to engage them in some different form or factor. And so the, 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 the questions that we need to be thinking about um, are, are what are the psychological hurdles that we can overcome to help a patient engage? You know, one of the areas that clearly that we've researched and uncovered is the fact that when, when initiated by a physician to the patient, they're more likely to engage at least up front initially. You know, obviously there's, there's a scale off that happens or a taper off that happens over the course of time from sustainability issues. The other thing that Susanna Fox talks about all the time when it, when it comes to caregivers is for the non-motivated, non-engaged individual, oftentimes there's some other significant other or some other motivating factor besides the patient themselves. We know that those that are engaged typically, you know, utilizing the Fitbits and the activity trackers and taking care of their health are those that are, that are motivated and doing it for themselves and they have that self-motivation. But the non-motivated folks typically um, relate to somebody else or some other directive coming from, from outside of themselves. No, it's a, it's, it's a very powerful point. In fact, people differentiate between engagement and activation and I think everyone, it really depends on not so much how well you're engaged but how you're using that information to create change. Fasayo, uh, you had a comment as well? Yeah, yeah. So just to add to what everyone said, I think it's very important to distinguish between planable conditions and conditions that are less planable. So by planable conditions, I'm talking about pregnancy, knee replacements, other kinds of procedures such as that, where you have engaged patients from more engaged patients from the outset versus conditions such as, you know, multiple sclerosis that are less planable. And so I think there are, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of opportunity with just segmenting uh, patients based on this and then innovating. And, uh, you know, for instance, pregnant women, uh, you know, thinking about where to, to deliver their babies, the kind of experience they want, you know, like the prenatal care. There's a lot of experience, um, opportunities and innovation in this space. But, you know, as, as has, has been said earlier, it's, you can't just bucket patients into one group, you know. Intrinsically, some patients are more motivated than others, and a lot of it might have to do with uh, how planable or how, or how less planable a condition is. So I think that's one uh, useful distinction to have in mind. Thank you, Vasayo. Um, Jenna, before, I know you wanted to add a comment to that, but while you do that, we had a good question that was brought to us by Alicia. And the question is, what non-healthcare companies employ processes that inspire you? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, development in sort of consumer experience and satisfaction. And, and if you could explain why as well. If you could just unmute your mic. Sorry, let me see if I can sort of do two birds with one stone here. Um, so I just wanted to add, um, absolutely agree with the comment on engagement as a psychological um, challenge. And uh, I mean, we've achieved a, a, you know, a pretty amazing level of engagement. We've got over over four million homework kind of sessions completed um, by individuals with eating disorders who are, and these are very confronting activities to achieve. And we employed some fairly um, fundamental behavior change principles, which anyone can follow. And um, I'd recommend as a resource Prochaska's stages of change model, which really defines different groups of motivation for individuals. And we generally target people who are either thinking about changing or adopting a new behavior or, or who have already started. And then we sort of look to activate them. Um, you, you, it does require a different approach to engage those who are pre-contemplation or haven't started thinking about it yet. Um, but then there's the fact that we're all kind of um, chickens at the end of the day, where these 
basic beings who are motivated by what makes us feel good. And that piece is just missing in so much technology. We've made a really clinical medical experience out of so much technology. So um, whereas if we can create a positive association with an, a behavior that we'd like to see repeated, we're going to see it repeated more. So, um, you know, if you get a chicken to do a behavior and then give it a pellet, you know, it's going to keep doing that. And if you make that pellet random so it doesn't know when the next reinforcement's coming, it'll keep doing it even more. And we do that in our application. There's a lot of random reinforcement and random reward, anything that will make someone feel good. There's pictures of baby animals, um, a lot of gifts, really cute things that anyone would smile at. Um, and it just takes the pain out of what's an otherwise quite difficult and confronting experience. Um, and that's kind of an intrinsic motivation. Ultimately, that will have a, a, a shelf life, but it allows someone to engage in something for long enough to achieve the intrinsic reward of having an optimal level of health or achieving a personal goal, which ultimately is what really drives lasting engagement. Um, and we have one example of this technique um, and how to, um, uh, what was the, the question around uh, non-healthcare processes. So if non-healthcare companies, um, our CTO does not have a background in, in healthcare and I think it's a huge advantage um, because there is a lot that we can borrow from, you know, outside of our little kind of sphere. And one of those things is kind of the Facebook or Twitter-esque activity feed. Um, so we found another place where this applies, which is for practitioners. When you think about what motivates them, um, it's patient engagement and seeing their patients doing well and achieving goals and engaging in something that they really their hearts into getting them to do. Um, so we have a live activity feed for clinicians of what their patients are doing in real time and that's quite addictive for a practitioner. It reinforces their fundamental kind of motivation for patient engagement. Um, so that's borrowed off Facebook and Twitter. It's something we see every day um, but not necessarily in the medical arena. Okay. Well just to acknowledge that question actually came from Twitter through from Chris in Dallas so thank you so much. We actually have a great question, another question from Twitter, uh, uh, Migraine Pal, and her question, or his question is, what are some ways to have the medical community take you seriously as a startup if you don't have the clinical research to back your value proposition? So um, it's definitely a difficult problem, is how do you get your foot in the door if you haven't invested all the research to get that basic data that no, most people in healthcare are sort of looking for. Um, let's, I think, uh, let's see here, Dr. Gulati or Dr. Wong, I think your expertise would, would help answer this question. Dr. Wong, you want to take that question, Dr. Wong, and I'll come afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I was, I was trying to see who was going to unmute their microphone first. Uh, <laughs> so um, it, it's it's a great question because I would say in most industries that we've looked at with disruptive innovation, this is really not a concern, right? Uh, you're going to face legal hurdles and regulatory barriers um, that have been basically either established or fortified by the incumbents because that is the environment they grew up in and they of course want to fortify them to discourage any new competition. However, when you look at folks like Airbnb or Uber um, or there's a television um, disruptor that I can't remember the name of, but they've all run up against some pretty heavy regulations in trying to set up and expand their businesses. Um, but I think the consumer demand there will eventually win out and the regulations and legislation simply needs to catch up. In the medical world, it's a little bit different. I think there's been this expectation that you still have to meet, you know, clinical gold standards of, uh, uh, of performance. And that is a big challenge. And so when I look at M Health uh, innovations and other um, new disruptors coming into healthcare, I don't discourage them from pursuing things like um, listing with the FDA or trying to partner with a research organization to collect some real data. I think if you fail to do those things, you are going to have a hard time breaking in uh, into the establishment. And while that strategy is a good one for disruptors elsewhere, as I've mentioned, in healthcare, unfortunately, I think they might be insurmountable. So um, at least 
my thought is that if if you really want to grow, you, you do need to collect some of that 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 data that the medical establishment unfortunately demands. Uh, great answer, and and Dr. Gulati, uh, in addition to that, in terms of what data that you would need or what would you advise other people on what to focus on in terms of unique challenges in healthcare, what else would you add to that? Well, I'm, I think we're seeing more and more of uh, sort of non-healthcare, non-medical folks come into healthcare and actually innovate in the space. And it's a growing trend that I've seen over the past couple of years, and, and quite frankly, it's very refreshing. Um, you know, I, sit as a, I serve as a mentor and advisor to a lot of these sort of healthcare seed accelerators like Blueprint Health and Startup Health and Rock and so forth. And, um, you know, I think that's a perfect case study for those types of environments. I mean, if you're looking to generate proof of concept, um, try to find initial, you know, client pool to pilot your product, you know, develop some sort of outcome metrics, even if you're not in the healthcare or medical community, I think those types of seed accelerators, you know, certainly provide a good advantage to those individuals who are not in the healthcare space, but can surround themselves with other individuals who are in the healthcare space that buy into their product. They can vouch for them. Um, so I, I've certainly seen a growing trend. In fact, I think they're, they're being more disruptive, as, as Jason was talking about, um, when they do come from outside of the medical community um, oftentimes. So I think it's a refreshing uh, perspective, and oftentimes I try to surround myself with those peoples because they bring a um, you know, different perspective to the table. I definitely agree with that. In fact, I think they've raised the bar in terms of expectations because the gap on the consumer side versus what's actually in traditional medicine is, is quite large. So I, I'm very appreciative of that cross-pollination. Um, one of the questions, actually, you know, we're, we're getting closer towards the end of time and I want to make sure that each of you answer this question. But what advice would you give panelists or those listening what, sorry, let me repeat that. What advice would you give those listening if they want to pursue their own venture in healthcare, what to do or what not to do? Uh, Doug, let's start with you. Well, I think <clears throat> working in this sector requires a certain amount of patience. I think that <clears throat> as much as there's a lot of great things happening, it does take time for the change to filter through the system. Um, especially working with doctors or partnering up with others in the industry. Um, I think there's so much really great things on the horizon, but um, go into it knowing that, you know, things like regulation, things like um, um, all these other pieces will take a little time to, to come into place. Okay. And Fasayo, what would you say is uh, some good advice to anyone tackling a venture in healthcare? Yeah, just to uh, add to uh, what Doug said, I think time is, you know, perhaps the most important thing. Uh, you know, it almost always takes longer than you think it's going to take, and you should just have that solidly in the back of your mind that uh, this might take uh, quite a while. The other thing is, um, is focus. Um, in, in healthcare, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of stakeholders, but uh, if you have a problem, it could be a simple problem, and just focusing on that simple problem, trying to always think, how am I solving a problem? How am I addressing a need? A very clearly defined need. I think that's uh, a big, uh, big piece of advice that I, I would like to give. Um, there's actually another good question from uh, Twitter, from Giller, it's about just patient engagement is is that could that be perceived as a paternalistic view of medicine and is that the wrong perspective? So, uh, Dr. Gulati, maybe you could get both questions. What inspiration or what uh, what what advice would you give? And what are your thoughts on is patient engagement in itself sort of a, a wrong angle because it's more too paternalistic? Uh, well, to answer the, the, the first question, I think, um, you know, the advice I can give to, to other entrepreneurs and innovators out there, I think uh, we need to somewhat change our mental construct and, and, and stop looking at innovation as either a sprint or a marathon. It's actually a relay. And I think we have a lot of great trinkets, a lot of little products that are existing out into the marketplace, but they need to figure out 
how they come together and how do we all play together in this world as far as collecting the data, piecing together the different silos of technology. So I always say innovation is neither a, mar neither a marathon nor a sprint. It's actually a relay. We need to be able to have the ability to pass it on and collaborate with others. And the more entrepreneurs that we can have uh, doing that, I think the better off our system will be and the quicker we're going to be able to, to meet the objectives that we all want to achieve in the healthcare system. Um, as far as the, the patient engagement um, being paternalistic, pr to preserve a pr paternalistic system, um, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a, a good perspective um, in, in response to that question, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that it's, it's preserving any kind of paternalistic system here. I think the, the, the value equation is balancing out between the patients and providers, and patients are becoming much more empowered in their own their own health care, but they're always going to need some sort of guide um, to help them navigate their pathway forward. I think it's a, it's a collaborative effort. It's not an either or a binary situation. Um, and we need to look at how the team works uh, collaboratively, collaboratively in the new environment, especially as ACOs come into place in the marketplace. Um, you know, so I don't think it's a doctor tell patient, patient listen to doctor type of system anymore. I think it's a, a collaborative team effort where the patient has a significant say in how they want their care, care managed. Okay, and uh, Jason, what advice would you have for anybody thinking about diving into uh, you know, a healthcare entrepreneurship venture? Sure. I, I guess when I think back to um, my days of, of uh, medical training, going through residency, I would look around the hospital and clinics that I worked through and, and just see all sorts of things that needed fixing. Um, and so the danger is that you got a lot of innovators focusing on patching up the current system. And it reminds me of that quote often attributed to Henry Ford, which is that, uh, you know, he, he's, he's uh, thought to have said that, you know, if I had listened to my customers, I would have, uh, wouldn't have built cars, I would have built faster horses. And it's basically this idea that, you know, you don't want to just look at the current situation and try to improve it, but instead to envision where the future is going to be and design for that. And so I think we've already identified so many trends that in other industries that I believe healthcare is going to follow. Things like uh, much more consumerization, the fact that everybody's carrying mobile phones and ha equipped with uh, sophisticated sensor technology. So I think all of these things are really moving healthcare in a vastly different direction than what we've been accustomed to. So what I would tell uh, new entrepreneurs is to make sure that you're designing for that future and not simply focused on what you see around you today. And, and Jenna, if you wanted to give advice to someone following your footsteps, what to do or what not to do, what what would you recommend? Uh, so, I mean, so many things, but I think that the one that really comes to mind is, um, and this is harking back to my days in evolutionary psychology, um, which is that a sitting duck gets eaten by parasites. Basically, like evolution is the key to survival, and if you don't keep moving, you're gonna die. <laughs> it is kind of a, it's a survival game, a startup game, and um, to me, the key to survival is to not sit around talking about it, thinking about it, but just do it. Being very predisposed to action rather than kind of contemplation, and maintaining that experimental mentality at all stages of the venture, particularly at the beginning, but that continues throughout. Um, we're constantly needing to evolve ourselves and explore new ideas. Um, so don't be a sitting duck. Get to work. <laughs> I, I could uh, that, I could definitely appreciate that. Um, Noga, hopefully <laughs> you're not a sitting duck, and I'm sure that you've been evolving in your ventures. What advice would you give to those listening? Yeah, I, I actually would echo a, a bit of what Jenna said. So, I mean, my advice to healthcare entrepreneurs is actually the same advice I give to entrepreneurs in other arenas as well, which is just start. Just start. There's, it's really easy to sort of sit back and wait for the perfect idea to cross your path. Um, but, you know, if there is a perfect idea, if there is an obvious problem, uh, an, an obvious solution to an existing problem, um, chances are that tons of people have already tried it. So, I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, you basically have to accept that you're going to dive in with lots of questions unanswered. Um, and um, and so, you know, the advice is basically just dive in. Just start doing whatever it is that you're thinking about doing. Excellent. You know, I think a lot of the advice that you've given, if people are listening out there, 
it's really these are wonderful pearls of wisdom and I think a lot of us have learned either from past mistakes or other people's successes so you know it's, we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have this group of panelists to offer their insights and we want to thank you I also want to take the time to thank all those following us on Twitter and giving us some some great questions um, any you know as we as we come to a close here I think it's one of the things that's worth noting is how much passion there is with each and every one of you. All of you are very passionate about what, about what you're pursuing and all of you this is just part of who you are and I think for a lot of people who are interested in pursuing their own startup this is not a part-time gig, this is not something that you're doing on the side this becomes a lot of who you are in, in, in your life and um, I think if we only have probably time for one person to answer this question, but how have you been able to balance the demands of, of this passion as you know as, as you're building your dream? Um, so I'm gonna pick at random here. Um, Jenna, I'm gonna start I'm gonna pick give this to you as we close off this session. I was sort of hoping you wouldn't pick me because I'm not a shining I'm not a shining example, but maybe that makes me a good example. I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, I think that for all of us, um, we're call, sort of we go beyond the call of duty. This is not a nine to five. Um, you know, the reality is that you're you're filling all roles in a company, um, and as you grow, the demands grow on you. It doesn't get easier. Um, and even as you start to bring on staff, um, then there's other challenges. So. Uh, I mean, for me, actually, it's I've started practicing mindfulness, something that I had never done before, um, and finding the thing that anchors me and, and clears my mind. So for me, that's running. Um, I, I do the dish run at Stanford fairly periodically. If you're there, you'll probably see me occasionally. Um, and also keeping good relationships, so really investing in family, in friendships. They'll be there with you through the ups and downs. Make sure you share the ups and downs. Talk. You're not alone. You can feel alone. Some days you just get the wind kicked out of you, but reach out, um, and you'll find that there's a lot of people going through what you're going through, and, and you've got a cheer squad, and it's pretty close at hand. Um, probably the, but yeah, I haven't quite mastered the art yet. I have to admit. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, and I think all of us are eternally thankful and appreciative of our friends and family because they're always there for us. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll definitely echo that. With that, I think we'll close this session. Um, again, thank you everyone for attending. I, this was really a lot of fun, very insightful, and we are eternally grateful for you guys as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live. Please note, we will not have a Thursday edition of MedX Live this week. Those episodes resume April 3rd, 2014, with the premiere of a new class from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Design for Health, a class on design innovation for improving healthcare. We'll see you back here on April 1st, 2014, April Fool's Day, at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, when we'll discuss the topic, Humor in Healthcare. You won't want to miss the next episode of Stanford Medicine X Live. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest panelists this evening. From all of us at Stanford Medicine X, We'll see you next time.